And uh, we're both based out of Zurich. I travel a lot, as everyone in the space. Um, and we're here for you today. So we're going to be covering a whole bunch of topics, everything from vision and um, general architecture of Definity to its co governance mechanisms. And then Robert is also going to deep dive on some of our uh, innovations. But what I, what I, what's very important to us is that we're here for you. So whenever you guys have a question, um, just jump up or let us know, and we'll, we'll answer that right away. Plus, we'll have some time at the end. And uh, if there's more motivation needed, we also have a bunch of cool t-shirts that we're going to give out for anyone who has questions. All right. <laughs> All right, let's jump in. So Definity. I'm going to start with like the, the big vision. So Definity is the internet computer. And before we can talk about what an internet computer is, I just want to go way, way back and talk about what a computer is. Um, it was originally defined in, as like mathematically defined by Alan Turing, um, this gentleman over here. Um, then we entered an era where we had computers on our desks, then we have them in our pockets, but kind of like these uh, standalone devices that do computations for us, all kinds of. Then we entered an age uh, which we could be seeing as the Web 2.0, where we have a cloud architecture, meaning we have a set of computers that uh, create a, a static group or a static network and then do computations for us. And now the internet computer uh, is what we think of uh, a dynamic network of computers that never stops, that dynamically group together and start and stop individually and help us execute applications on a global scale, unstoppable, completely decentralized applications. And so Definity is part of this fourth era of computers. And we'll talk a bit more about um, why we think that makes sense or why it's important um, over the course of this uh, presentation and also how we make it happen. So first, this is how the internet computer looks like. Um, very nice uh, GIF that we created. Um, this is actually showing our testnet run. So we have, for those who have done a bit of research on Definity, you've probably seen that we're not trading on any exchanges. We're not live yet. Our network is not running yet. Um, we still have investors, so some tokens are assigned, but the network is not live. But we have testnets running, um, and the, it works. <laughs> um, and we'll be showing a roadmap a bit later um, for you to see um, when this is all going to uh, be available to all of you. And then also Robert is going to show you a bit, about more, a bit more details about this testnet and what it's actually capable of right now. But on the big picture, a, an internet computer is a network of computers. Each and every one can be a server. It could be as simple as your uh, desktop computer or laptop. They all use a protocol. Or they all use the same client software to connect to each other. And we call those mining nodes. So mining in Definity. Um, means you're running the Definity client and it connects to other computers in the network and they together uh, execute some applications. And one of the big benefits um, of having this internet computer or having this decentralized world computer is that they're inherently resistant to faults or, or um, interruptions. Because it dynamically starts and stops and regroups itself, there's no way for it to ever be shut down once you reach enough traction, once enough people are convinced that there's value in this network. And the way Definity scales, um, I, I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar with Bitcoin and Ethereum, and uh, Ethereum originally introduced this idea of smart contracts. Definity goes a step further and, and talks more about distributed apps and uh, kind of more capable applications that can be run on this distributed computer. And one of the ways uh, how it scales, and Robert will later on talk more about how it scales much, much better than existing technology and, and what's different about Definity, um, is three dimensions. One is computation. What that means is we, we, the more computers or the more miners join the network, the more computational uh, cycles will be able to execute at any given time. Second is storage. Um, so Definity is not a storage-focused protocol like Filecoin, but storage is still a big part of it. The more computers we have, the bigger the internet computer grows, the more data can be stored on it. 
And then third, memory, meaning uh, the, uh, the state between two different blocks um, will get more and more capable the more com machines join the network. And here's a very important term, WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a core aspect of what makes the Affinity applications more capable than, for example, smart contracts on Ethereum. WebAssembly is not something that we've invented, but we're adopting it and we're uh, driving it forward. But WebAssembly is, they call it the first open standard for universal software that runs anywhere. What that means is that the big browser manufacturers, so Apple, let's see if I get it right, Microsoft, Apple, Mozilla, and Google, yeah. They got together and they thought about how can we make internet applications more powerful? Um, um, if you're a web developer, you know that um, the applications that you usually send to the browsers, they consist of typically three languages, HTML, CSS, and then JavaScript. And all these languages get compiled or executed at runtime, meaning they're pure text files, and it's kind of hard for the browser to read those at the same time as they're already supposed to be executed. And so they thought about bringing a more efficient standard to all browsers. And what they've come up with is WebAssembly, which is a byte code format. What that means, it's the first time that you can send compiled code to your browser, which is a lot more efficient to run, and it offers a number of other benefits as well, which uh, among them, uh, security, and um, you can mask applications. Like, they're compiled, so you don't offer just your source code and, and secrets to anyone anymore. So this was developed by these big browser manufacturers, and we're adopting them in the Affinity as we call them canisters. And the reason why we've gone with that standard is that we think that WebAssembly is going to be a big topic over the next few years, because all these big browsers are adopting them. They're actually live already, but you don't find too many applications yet. And we want to be not just yet another platform that you have to learn. We don't want to be just yet another standard that you have to first understand. We want to make it very easy for the biggest group of developers on the planet, which are web developers, and that's why we're adopting the same standard. Why? Or, or beyond the efficiency and the higher throughput that you reach with WebAssembly, there's a few other uh, advantages. One of them is that because it's a byte format, you can use uh, a number of higher level languages to then compile it into WebAssembly. So what that means, not all of these are available, but there's going to be a number of compilers that you can use to use any of these higher level languages to produce WebAssembly. So, for example, if your language of choice is Java or C++ or Haskell, in the past you would have always, you had to use something like JavaScript or HTML to produce web applications. Now in the future you can stick to Haskell or Ruby or Java, and that also means that you can open it up to a whole new set of applications. Because for machine learning, typically you wouldn't want to use JavaScript, or maybe there's not as many libraries available as for Python. So in the future, you can just stick to the language and the framework that makes, makes the most sense, and then compile it into Wasm and send it to the browser. Yeah, and that's just uh, an example of how Wasm bytecode looks. And then the way we bring this to the affinity is, is kind of twofold. One, we're going to have these canisters or actors, or that's our name for what smart contracts are on Ethereum. So a way to deploy applications onto a blockchain infrastructure, onto a decentralized infrastructure. That's what's happening here. So you're going to have your business logic, and you're going to have your database or state or uh, long-term information. And then you're going to have ports. And these ports are there to interact with whatever interface you choose, but the most obvious one is probably a browser, so you could open a port 80 or 8080. 80, 80. And then you can use the same technology that you've used here, WebAssembly, to write stuff in your browser, and then interact with the blockchain, and use that as an interface to your business logic on the blockchain. So what are some of the benefits of running on this decentralized world computer versus your traditional Web 2.0 or even Web 1.0 infrastructure where you have one or just a static set of servers? We think that one, security is going to be improved because it's a much more transparent environment so people can 
generally see what you're doing and they can help you improve it. Whereas in the um, traditional world, it's all protected and you're always uh, working on an application per application basis and you need to work on your firewall and your network settings and all that. And in Dfinity, that's all taken care of by the internet computer. So you can focus more on business logic. The second reason could be reliability. Um, whereas in the traditional world, you always have to worry about backups and uptime and network connections and Wi-Fi. Um, and there's a lot of uh, bottlenecks or single points of failure in your typical infrastructure. The internet computer, at least in theory, this is all to be proven, but because it's so decentralized and it's so uh, hardware generic and it can be run in so many data centers, the chances of it ever going down are very, very small. And because it's all blockchain-based, the chances of losing data are also much, much smaller than they are in the traditional world where you can just erase a database and if there's no backup, you're uh, stuck. Then one more thing, if you're working on traditional web applications, you're always interfacing with third-party apps and they all use different protocols. Some use REST APIs, some use older protocols. With Dfinity, because it's all going to be hosted on the same computer, it's a lot easier to operate or interoperate with each other, with other applications, uh, interface with other applications. And last but not least, privacy. So because cryptography is built into the internet computer or these distributed systems, you can make use of that and protect what you need to protect. Whereas in the traditional world, it's always a matter of um, you figuring out what's right for which application and uh, there's no kind of generally available toolbox that allows you to securely protect your data. Yes? Should I go back? I think it's just, yeah, so if I get the question right, it's um, you think that security, interoperability, and privacy could all be built into traditional systems. Why um, is it such a big step forward, um, right? Yeah. I think it's all a matter of perspective. What we think is that, because in this new world where it's all decentralized, a lot of this is built in. So you don't have to think about it, and you don't have to provide the systems for that. So even if you're a web developer that wants to build a very simple application, you're probably not going to, um, you don't want to worry about creating backups and uh, failover systems and lots and lots of redundancy. And that's all built into the new world of uh, decentralized, uh, decentralized computation. Um, I think a lot of it comes with decentralization. For example, the, the fact that your database cannot just be erased or you cannot lose data that was there in the past just comes with the blockchain architecture because it's immutable. Like you could, you could later on say this record um, is uh, uh, removed, but you could always go back a few blocks and see that it's still there if you ever wanted to get it back. Whereas if you delete something in a traditional MySQL database or any other database system, like the data might, might actually be completely gone. Yeah. Yes. Well, so I fully agree with the first point. It's a huge um, overhead, right? Because all, and, and this not, does not only go for storage, but it also goes for computation. Because if you want to make sure that um, everything is done the right way, you're going to have the same transactions executed by every miner. So instead of doing the computation once, you're going to have to do it hundreds of times, right? And the next slide actually um, uh, will talk about that. What t-shirt size are you wearing? <laughs> Medium? Small? <laughs> All right. It's, uh, it's European, so I'll give you a medium. 
you go. Oh. Okay, so I think you hit a very critical point. So this is not probably the way for all applications. We think that a lot of applications will benefit from this infrastructure, and we also think that there's going to be hybrids between uh, putting some data on the internet computer or the fully decentralized hardware or uh, infrastructure, while still keeping some data off-chain in traditional infrastructure. And we think that a lot of these systems that we mentioned up here, order management systems, uh, user forums, e-commerce, I personally really think that, uh, for example, something like voting will inherently, like, will benefit a lot from the additional transparency and the decentralization. And that's somewhere where the benefits of what you gain outweigh the additional computation and storage that you need to go through, and that's why you will live on decentralized hardware. On the other hand, we think that there's, uh, we, we mentioned two here, but I think there's more. Um, there are certain types of applications that will not move onto such a decentralized architecture in the near future, which are those that are extremely data intensive, so big data stuff, or uh, extremely computation intensive, artificial intelligence, because there you're much better off using all the computation you have on your network uh, for individual transactions than using them all to verify one transaction. Yeah. So who's uh, participating and who's providing all the storage, computation, and memory? Um, in Definity, it's miners. And uh, the, the term mining, we, we talk about it a lot, whether mining is the right term, because it's so... Um, it's so predefined by what mining is in proof-of-work systems. So Definity is a proof-of-stake system, which means we don't have the riddles or puzzles that you have in proof-of-work systems like Bitcoin or Ethereum to determine who signs the next block. Um, I don't know, are you going to talk a bit more about Yeah, you're going to talk more about that, but um, in general, so for now we call it mining, we could also call it validation, or we've been talking about a lot of terms, but what do you do when you connect your servers and machines to the network is first you install the, the mining nodes. And what's different with us than um, Ethereum or Bitcoin is you will be able to mine with uh, normal or generic hardware. So there's no special GPUs needed. There's no ASICs or um, special chips needed. And that gives us a few opportunities. And one of them is we have a high interest in this system being very distributed, meaning there's a lot of mining going on around the globe and not just a few big mining pools that occupy most of the mining power in the network. And that's why we've made some uh, architecture decisions. One of them is to make this hardware um, fairly standard so that a lot of hosting centers can mine for Definity. And what we hope they will do is they, they'll use idle space or idle computation power that they have in their network uh, for uh, down peaks or when there's just not when they haven't rented out everything in their uh, inventory to mine for Definity and make some money uh, through that. And then yeah, what's similar to proof of work mining is that mining is one way to make uh, Definity tokens, and the way you do that is by validating new blocks, but also by processing transactions. Yeah, and in general, what Definity has in common with many other networks is it's also a token-operated network, meaning at the core there is a token, and we use that for a number of things. One of them we talked about is computation. So all those miners, they will replicate transactions across the network. Number two is you need a certain amount of tokens to mine for the network. That's part of the proof-of-stake mining that Robert will explain in a bit. And the number three is governance. And that's an interesting point. You've probably all heard about uh, Ethereum hard forks or many other networks uh, that hard forked because the community could not agree on one way to go forward. And this could be uh, large decisions like naming conventions or which client to adopt or in which language um, uh, to, to uh, release the next version. But it could also be smaller things like the Bitcoin block size where some people think it should be larger, some people sh think it should stay at one megabyte. And that's why we thought a lot about how to solve that for the future, because we believe that uh, for this to really work and be a global initiative, there needs to be an efficient way for all participants to come to conclusions together. 
And so whenever you own the affinities or the token that we're going to release, you can also stake these, meaning you can deposit them. And in return for depositing them, you get neurons. And neurons are, you could see them as a voting token. So those are not tokens that you're going to sell or trade, but you can use them to make decisions in the network. And the way this will work is, and we call this the blockchain nervous system, BNS. The way this will work is everyone can come up with proposals. And these proposals were not, the system does not fully exist yet. It's not fully specified yet, but proposals could be wide ranging. It could be, we should change the block size to a certain amount, or it could be, hey, the next version of the client should be this versus another one. And anyone can come up with these proposals. And then these proposals are shown to what we call the blockchain nervous system, which is an implementation of liquid democracy or de delegative democracy, which means instead of, uh, or it's, it's kind of similar to how we vote nowadays where we have politicians. We kind of delegate our votes to a politician, only that this is a lot more transparent and immediate. So if there's a vote coming up um, about a certain parameter, then I'm, I'm going to know like, I'm going to delegate my vote to Robert because he knows a lot more about that stuff. Whereas if it's something about whether or not a certain project should receive uh, money out of our ecosystem fund, maybe he's going to delegate his votes to me because he knows I spend a lot of time with that. Here are just some examples. Um, and then what that does after the voting uh, has run and all those neurons have been uh, gone for uh, one of the proposals, it's automatically adopted and then run on the network. I have a yes. How uh -huh. uh, yep. So I think a first protection against that is that um, for all these mining identities, it, it's not really dependent on how, man, how much computation power you have, but how much you can stake. Meaning, for each miner, you will have to deposit a certain amount of DFINITIES. So Amazon would first have to really invest in the network. And even then, I think, because once you have that many tokens on your balance sheet, you want to do what's right for the network. You want the, uh, the amount of, or the, the, the value of a token to increase. And so if Amazon was suddenly to kind of monopolize the network, um, the network would lose attractiveness, and so the token val value would go down. The network would die, but Amazon would also lose its investment. So um, the only scenario where I could see them doing this is, A, if they were to make a huge investment into the tokens and then completely write it off on the balance sheet eventually. Yeah. Did that answer the question? Or if you have a follow-up uh, question, go ahead. Yeah. Size L? Large? You don't want a T-shirt? Medium. Yeah. Sure, yeah. All right. Um, and then I also want to say a few words about where we stand. Um, and I'll start before this. So the affinity started as a uh, kind of like a, a thought experiment about five years ago, 20, uh, well, four years ago, 2013, 2014. That's when Dominic Williams, our founder, started really working on it as, as a concept. And then about two years ago, we started a Swiss foundation based in Zug. We did an ICO about one and a half years ago. Um, this was not one of those like huge projects that made headlines, but we collected about the equivalent of about 4 million Swiss francs in roughly 24 uh, hours back then. This was when Ether was still worth about $12. Um, and so we, we were pretty well funded for our first year. And then about three, four months ago, beginning of this year, we were able to announce another uh, funding round together with Andreessen Horowitz and Polychain, who invested just over 61 million into us. Um, and part of that was an investment into an ecosystem fund. So these investors not only believe in the technology, but also in the long-term view of what the internet computer will enable. And they believe that the true value of this network will only come into existence once 
we are able to build applications on top of it. Only for building applications like governance systems and kind of a few of those. Uh, I'm personally very uh, passionate about education being one of the applications that should be decentralized and uh, combined with identity. So we're going to work a lot on that once we have launched. So currently, um, last October, we, we launched our first testnet. Robert is going to show uh, some of that later on. Um, what we're working on right now is a first release of our SDK. So we're going to uh, show you what, or we're going to give you a, an environment where you can execute WebAssembly applications as if they were executed on the blockchain, so people can start developing applications. And then towards uh, Q3 of this year, we're going to work on the blockchain nervous system and propose a first uh, prototype of that on how the voting will, voting will work. And then somewhere in Q4, I personally believe that October is a bit uh, optimistic. I think it's probably going to happen towards, it's probably going to be a Christmas present. Uh, we're going to uh, launch our token network. And then Q1 of next year, hopefully we'll see some first uh, completely decentralized applications running. All right. And with that, I'll hand over to Robert. And uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, if each neuron has one vote. Um. Great thoughts. Um, I'm personally very passionate about talking more about uh, governance systems and, and voting, so maybe we can uh, form it's a group after. Voting, yeah. But it's about letting everyone achieve the state becoming a neuron and then allow them to vote. So the, 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 the topic is participation and um, being responsible or achieving responsibility in the minds of people, but this is a long way of education too. So. You always have to work on both sides, yeah. and in education. But this is the, the classical system, how it already works. Right. I just, so I think very super interesting thoughts, and, uh, and this is going to, like, we could probably talk all night just about no. voting. Um, <laughs> um, I think there's always a fine line between one man, one vote, and also education. Because there are, t there, there are certainly topics where I should have a certain amount of education or, or done a certain amount of reading or at least familiar familiarize myself with a topic before I vote, right? Let's say when it's about humanitarian rights, like everyone in here should have an equal vote. When it's about um, trade treaties, then clearly not everyone is in the same position to make a sophisticated vote, right? Um, so I'm super excited about how, to, how we can combine education and skill sets and experiences with your uh, power of voting and uh, where you can have an influence. So let, let's deep dive on that after the... Um, General session, yeah? 
All right, and with that, over so, to Robert. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So let me maybe start with summarizing some of the key aspects or advantages that makes like Definity stand out from the crowd or offers some innovation. So, I mean, we already, or you already mentioned capacity, the, the fact that Definity is supposed to scale out to offer more and more throughput and capacity with more and more nodes that join the network. But we also have another aspect which is very important, that's speed. And, and by speed I mean the time a transaction needs to get finalized. So you all know or maybe know that Bitcoin transactions take an hour and you only have like a probabilistic um, certainty that the transaction cannot be undone later on. And we are trying to achieve that in three to five seconds and to offer like a, a finality that's provably like almost 100% secure. What we, you also mentioned the governance aspect. I won't, I won't cover that now. Um, another, yes? So it's So it's it's the time when your application is sent to the network and no, no or let's be more precise it's the time when your transaction gets included in the first block then you will need to wait 3 to 5 seconds in order to get your transaction like um Finalized. So you cannot, I mean, the fact or the question whether your block will get included or your transaction will get included in a block, I mean, that's an economical question that will depend on the transaction fees and how you set them. And also, if I. So that, that's the general latency that. You mean that, like your computer needs some time to like communicate with the blockchain network? In short, you have to like add that time to the finality time that's offered by the system on a system level. The, yeah. So if if I can just add, I think there's two concepts. One is you interacting with the blockchain or or computers that uh, combined make up the the internet computer, which can be much much faster. This is how quickly it can write something to storage, to permanent storage. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's the three to five seconds. Okay, so let's move on to randomness, which is, as we will see later on, a very important ingredient of the system to make this speed and capacity, like, to, to uh, offer this. And then we already mentioned the proof of stake aspect, so there won't be this waste of energy on like doing proof of work puzzles. And then you also mentioned the WebAssembly part. So let's go a step forward. Um, proof of stake in Definity is maybe a bit different than in some existing projects or blockchains. So you like you make a deposit. You some you would have to deposit some fixed size amount of stake in Definities for a given amount of time, so let's say four months, it's not decided yet. And then you get a mining identity or a mining node as you, in return. And with that, you have this mining identity, you can participate in the network, you can not only mine, but you can also, if you want, like create neurons. But then after four months, you can like withdraw your deposit and then of course your mining ID will be like removed from the system. So that's just to give you a basic idea how proof of stake works in Definity. It's because it often leads to confusion because in other systems you can deposit any amount of stake and you get one ID and the, uh, the power of that ID depends on like your fraction of, of stake in the whole system. But here it's like there are units, these IDs. So you can, if you are more wealthy than others, you can afford to buy more IDs, but it all depends on the number of IDs. So your power is proportional to the number of IDs that you own. So with that, let me like, give you a background why this proof of stake is so difficult to achieve in practice, why it's more difficult than proof of work, and why we need like, really good cryptography and math behind it to, make, uh, to create a secure system. So, I mean, there's one basic problem in blockchain, on every blockchain, so 
and it is the question how we can select or choose who should create the next block or who should be the next miner. And this question is very important or because if somebody or anybody can like manipulate this question and give himself like a higher chance to create blocks, then it, it is the fair or then the fair um, share would be, then this of course would make the system like insecure. So we need a mechanism for that. Um, how many out of you have heard or know about the problem of nothing at stake? So two people. Okay. <laughs> so let me like just give you a quick um, explanation of that. So with proof of work in Bitcoin, there can be forks, or basically with any blockchain there can be forks. And once such a fork, we see that with A and B occurs, you have to somehow decide on which fork you want to add your block. For that, we have rules like the longest chain rule in Bitcoin that gives any, every chain like a weight, and you should like mine on the chain that has the highest weight. So well, so good, but the problem with that, so, or in, in proof of stake, that's a good system because you are, like, you have an incentive to follow that rule because it doesn't make sense for you to split your computational power on two chain ends. You should really just focus on one because if you split it up, you re reduce your chances of finding one block. But with proof of stake, it's different. With proof of stake, mining doesn't cost you, or it costs a minimal amount of computation. So it makes sense economically to behave, uh, to not stick to the rules and just say, if you see like this, so like um, a chain fork, then you will mine on top of both, like on, in, on the right hand side, which is bad because then the system loses its, its um, capability to converge to one fork or to one valid chain because that's what we want. We don't want to have forks all the time. And with proof of stake, it's not like trivial to achieve that. And it gets even worse. So the problem, I mean, there are like ideas to, um, to um, tackle this problem by just saying, okay, if somebody does that, so somebody um, creates blocks on two chain ends, we can punish him because that's like a proof you can see that on the blockchain, you can punish him. That works to some degree, and maybe we will also use this kind of system, but it is not sufficient on its own, because if you think, uh, if, if you have the big picture in mind, and you know that you can only punish people who have made a deposit, because all that you can punish, or that you have to punish someone is like slash, or remove his de deposit. And a fork can last longer than four months. So if you have a deposit period of four months, if someone is able to create a fork that's maybe five months long, then you cannot like apply penalties. So this kind of attacks wouldn't be deterred by penalties. And the problem with that, I mean, in some systems is that people who owned like their coins in the past, they can sell their keys, they can sell their private keys of their accounts because they have already sold their like stake to other people so they have no um, value in that. So an, an attacker could come and bribe the people or just buy their old keys. And the, the, the bad thing is that he doesn't even need to buy the, the majority or 51% of the keys to create a longer um, fork because in most systems we have a problem called stake grinding, which means that the system somehow needs to like, have a rule who, can, who will be the next miner. So this problem needs to be solved somehow, and it is solved by randomness. But if the random number generator is not like, really 100% secure, people can go back in time and try every single, so, so like grind through the parameters, so try every combination to, get, uh, um, to create a, a chain fork that's longer than the valid chain. So what we need is really, for our system, is a strong, unmanipulable randomness for the past, for the present, and for the future. So, and this is really at the, so this system stands at the core of DFINITY. So the question is how can we create strong randomness? So one of the, the known or existing solution to this problem is the co our commit and reveal schemes, which basically means we have a number of persons, so this is just Alice and Bob, but we can have like 100 people there, they, they can like commit to some secret value. They can like lock the value in a safe, 
And everyone does that, and, and afterwards, everyone has to unlock his safe and take out his value, and then all the values are like aggregated with some mathematical function, and then this should give you a random number. Well, it works somewhat, but the problem with this scheme is that there will be like a person who reveals his share or his sh uh, share of the secret last, so for the last. Um, and then the problem with that is that this person can already predict what would be the outcome with if he releases his secret share and he could also see what would happen if he do don't, uh, doesn't release his share. So he can manipulate just with this by deciding whether or not to release his secret, he can or, um, influence the outcome. And if we imagine like really lottery applications, let's say, where you can win millions of definities or dollar, dollars, then this kind of attack becomes realistic. So we want a system that doesn't suffer from even one bit of influence. So and we, to, to um, provide this kind of strong randomness, we start by or a digital signature scheme. So a normal digital signature scheme means that you have a private key and, any, uh, and, and the, the owner of the private key can sign a piece of data. Then the, the, the key, so the signature is added to that uh, piece of data. And then everyone who has the public key of this person can check whether the signature is correct. He looks at the signature and looks at the piece of data and, com um, and compares it and then he see, will see whether the signature is correct or not. And we can take this simple signature scheme a step further. We can um, have a system called threshold signature. Threshold signature means that you have not only one private key but you have maybe in this example five persons with, or five IDs with five private keys. And now let's say every, that three of them create um, a signature, and then there is a function that allows you to aggregate or combine these three signatures together and to create one resulting signature. And then the nice thing is that everyone who has the public key can now check whether this signature is correct or not. So it's a, like a multi-signature scheme, but with the difference that you just need to have like a threshold. We can say, okay, we need three out of five, or we need 100 out of 200, or 200 out of 400 signatures to be able to recreate this resulting a key. And the interesting fact about this is, you see, now we have another subset of three people who signed um, the piece of data, and it's the same outcome. So, so it will be the same. It doesn't matter who, which, which three out of four people sign this, the signature will be exactly the same. And this is very interesting because with the scheme, so or maybe we have like found um, a signature scheme that offers this kind of threshold variant. It's called the BLS or Bonelin Shaham um, signature scheme. And this really offers the, all the properties that we need to create a, yeah, a very strong random number generator because it allows you to create randomness that's unmanipulable because it doesn't matter which subset signs. It's always unique, so it means that the result will be the same, no matter which subset signs. And it's also unpredictable, unless you have a control, maybe 51%, so if you control the whole threshold that you need to combine it, then of course you will be able to predict the outcome, but if you don't control the majority, you won't be able to um, predict anything. And it's also nice because all the, 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 the signature creation and aggregation can be done on your own individually. It's non-interactive, so it's very in easy to just collect the signatures and everyone can collect them and put them together and see what the result is. Um, its size and performance is, is not as fast as maybe other schemes, but it's, or the size is very small, but it, the verification time is 1.8 milliseconds on like an Apple MacBook 2000 from 2013, it's okay for our person. It's not the fastest, but it should be fast enough. And we have, this scheme also offers what's called a distributed key generation, which I will cover uh, in a sec. So, but now just see the, the benefit of this threshold scheme. So what we can do now is create a chain of random numbers. So we can say, we have some initial random number in the genesis block and then this random number can select like a group of 400 people 
And now we, the, this group of 400 people, or any subset of 200, one of them can sign this, um, this initial random value. And if you have this, these four, 201 signatures, you can combine them and create the next value of the random beacon. So the signature on the previous outcome of the random beacon is like the next random number. So and you can do that over and over again and create a chain of random numbers. It's not the blockchain because it's only a chain of random numbers. You don't have any transactions in them. You don't have a payload. But it's just a simple chain of numbers which are random and unmanipulable. And you can also use this threshold scheme for another purpose, which is called, we call the block notarization. It, it is basically the same. We, now we have the real blockchain, so with the data in it. And instead of just saying, OK, everyone can build a block, and this block is already valid for it, we can have a group, a threshold group, vote or like threshold sign this block to, to make it more like author authoritative or to like increase its, its uh, w value so, or it's the trust we can put into that block. So now that to wrap up here, so we have with one mining ID, you will not only have one function in the network, but you will have all the functions and responsibilities that we covered. So you will act as a block maker and create blocks. You will also be part of the random beacon. You will uh, be part of this randomness creation. And you will also be part of the notary who signs these blocks and notarizes them. And now just this is a little um, slide about how we select like the next block maker, because the block makers, these are like, they have an individual role. The notary and, um, and the random beacon group, they are like collective roles. They must cooperate in some way, or at least half of them must cooperate. But here, this is individual, for, because a block can only be made by one person. But we have a rule, a ranking algorithm that takes the minor base, so it takes the whole population of IDs. And it uses the random beacon as a random number generator to create a ranked list of block makers. And now we see that, or we can have a system where the, the top ranked block maker has, has the first priority to create the block. If he fails to create it, then the next one can step in. And if the next one fails as well too, so then the third one can create his block. Uh, yes? So it's just by random. It, it's just a random. It's just random. It's nothing else. It's just a pure randomness. So oh. large <laughs> media. Okay, but good question. Yeah. So now we can have the same randomness. So we can to select groups. So the randomness can be used, as you have already seen in the on one of the previous slides, that we can use the random number generator to select another, the next group of 400 nodes, which will then act as the next notary and um, a random beacon group. So, and with all these two, oh, there's one more tool that we need, <laughs> sorry, and this is the distributed key generation. So, once you've selected a group, the group will not already, so, so we need a phase or some setup to create this initial key share. So, the group would somehow needs to agree on a set of keys. But of course, the, the keys itself, or one key, shouldn't only be known by the node, so by one node. So the, the keys should be secret, but they should at the same time be like correlated to each other because in, in the end they should like work in this threshold signature scheme. I cannot like tell you the details, it's a bit complex, it involves multiple rounds and everything, but in the end you will end up having like 400 keys or key shares, individual key shares, and, and, and everyone will agree on one public key, which will be spread to, to everyone. So, and this public key allows you to check whether the signature is correct or not. And with that at hand, now we can really put everything together to build our system. We have two chains. We have the random beacon chain. Here it is like denominated by these Xi um, letters. And we have the blockchain with B. And R is the round. And this sigma there, the, this is the, like the notarization, which is like on the block. 
And now we can we have like the, the 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 current output of the randomness. We can use that to choose uh, like select nodes at random, as we as you um, said. And then this allows you to prop or this will allow the, the the top ranked or the maybe the top five ranked block proposers to propose blocks. And now the notary group will come and threshold sign this block, so notarize this block, and once that's done, we will get a notarization on that block. And now that block is considered valid. Now the same group will come and like threshold sign the, the randomness, which means that they can create the next output of the random beacon. And then the same can go on and on, so we can have a new block and a new group which will notarize it. And basically, the interesting property of the random beacon chain is that it is unforkable. Forks are not possible because it really doesn't matter who, which subset of 201 nodes signs. The outcome is always the same, so it's not forkable. And the blockchain itself, it is theoretically forkable, but we can prove mathematically that forks are very short-lived and very unlikely to happen. So in forks, there won't be like forks of 10 blocks or something like that, maybe two, but that shouldn't even happen. So normally there shouldn't be forks. And that, I mean, that's just to like um, an overview of how this algorithm works. So it's whenever you have a new round or a new block that should be built at a, say, at a certain height, then you will have a new group. And this group will wait some time. We call it block time. It will be probably two seconds and collects block proposals from all the, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the miners. And then it looks whether there is already a block that has already been notarized. Or not. If there's no or notarized block yet, then it will notarize the, the, the best, so the top rank, the highest rank block from, this, the, the, uh, from the collection of blocks. And everyone does that, and there's a loop, and once a node sees that, oh, now I, can, I have collected um, 201 signatures on one block, I can put them together, and I can spread the resulting signature, so that means now I can stop. Now we have a solution, now we have notarized the block. So all that the group now has to do is sign the next random uh, beacon. Sorry, does this all happen in that three to five seconds? Essentially what you're showing us there is, is in that three to five seconds. So this happens, e this should happen in like two seconds. Okay, so three to five seconds is two blocks. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's like a, a yeah, that's a, an artificial bottleneck because if we, did, we didn't have a block time, then the network couldn't keep his pace. So everyone would work at his pace, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't really work. So with that, we can have a regular pace at which blocks can be built. So pace is it. Mm -hmm, a pacemaker, so <laughs> in that sense, yeah. So and and with that, and I cannot go into the details. It's a bit complex here, but with this. <laughs> The only part that's a bit complex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With all the notarizations, we can like mathematically prove that in normal situations, so normal situations mean there is no fork, and normally there shouldn't be forks. You can say that after two confirmations, so we have a transaction that gets included in a block, and that block gets referenced by the next block, and then you 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 must wait like um, the network round trip time, which means you must wait the time that a message takes to reach every node and come back. And if you wait like two confirmations plus the network round trip time, which is, should be like five seconds in worst case, you, you can have a, a almost 100% security that this transaction or this block wouldn't re get reverted anymore. So that's it. So maybe if you have questions, we can, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the, the really the threshold, this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. Thank you, Connor. Um, when you're talking about the uh, no matter which subset signs, uh, considering, for example, the first and the second one actually are illegitimate, but then you select one, two, and three, that means 67% of them are illegitimate. Do you still get the... <laughs> Uh, the same, actually, uh, signature. What do you mean by illegit? So malicious? Uh, yeah, malicious. Okay. So, I mean, you can, that's a good question, because you need to first, before you can combine all the signatures together to create a 
the threshold signature, you first have to check every individual signature. You can do that because you have the public key. Mm -hmm. So you will first check whether an individual signature is correct or not. If it's not correct or invalid, you will just drop it. So you will always just take the valid signatures from, so you, you, from the, the whole group. So, okay, you so before the actually subset, actually all the, all the individual ones needs to be verified? Yes. Okay. So you get maybe, we have from 400 nodes, we get right. maybe 380 signatures. Then you check them, maybe 350 are okay, and then that's enough to, because it's more than 201. So you just um, sort out the, the, the invalid one, if there, there's, uh, there are any invalid signatures. Okay, so the first one and the second one will never be invalid. I mean, we don't see it here. I mean, if they could be invalid if they just create some random value instead of a signature. Or mess up. To mess up the signature. They can do that, but, but then every person who combines the signatures can check that and, and just um, ignore okay. these. Oh, T-shirt size? Oh, cool. I'll give you a medium. Here you go. Uh, yeah. You mentioned before that voting is delegated or can be delegated. Is staking also delegated? No, it's not delegated. Proof of stake is just you that put make or, cr or put down a certain amount of stake and okay. get an ID from the system. But you, but you could have delegated proof of stake. So. <laughs> One of the big examples, uh, advantages before was that you don't need an ASIC, you don't need a GPU, you can run mm -hmm. it on any computer. So if I'm, if my node is randomly selected and my internet's down, mm -hmm. do I then lose my stake? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we require from our miners, so that's the current thinking, that they can provide a relatively high service level. So you should really have a backup infrastructure, probably. So, I mean, we haven't decided the parameters yet, but you should just... Uh, an amateur miner who just like turns on his computer and mines for some few days a week, that wouldn't work probably. Okay, but so, so basically that means miners are going to have uninterruptible power, guaranteed uptime internet, um, it means that it's not, it's not basically decentralized. It's not decentralized, so it's not decentralized, it's, I mean, it, there are certain requirements uh, regarding the reliability of your mining infrastructure. You don't need to have like, a supercomputer, you just need to have a reliable computer and a reliable internet connection. Also, the, the penalty could be anything. It doesn't mean you lose your whole stake, it could mean you lose uh, a fraction of a token. Uh, okay, so it's whatever's linked to that specific ID? Yes. Or would it be a fraction of what's linked to that ID? Yeah, whatever you, so we'll require, let's say the, um, what you need is a deposit of 50 Dfinities to create your mining ID. Mm -hmm. um, then maybe, and this is undecided, but you could lose maybe one token if you're, not, if you're down for a certain period of time or if you're not responsive even a certain amount of time. Okay, yeah. and any, are there any plans to introduce delegated staking or not? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not delegated so it's staking, It's not our no. philosophy. Okay, cool, thank you. I don't think so that we have, but we I don't have a, Yeah, but the, the big difference is that the, the energy here will go to actual transactions versus some riddles that no one actually profits from. Like, it's not just a consensus mechanism eating up this whole uh, amount of computational power, it's the actual applications that are going to be run. It's more efficient, essentially. Yeah. Which is what the, the whole thing is about. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what um, uh, Bitcoin uh, TPS, a transaction per second, I think it's seven. Mm -hmm. Ethereum is 15. Do you know your uh, TPS already? That's a good question. I cannot give you a number on that, but it should be, I think, 20x or maybe even more, like higher mm -hmm. than that, or probably than even yeah. that. Yeah. Ethereum, because we have, b we, with this mechanism that we have subgroups that sign transactions and we have like a very short block time of two seconds. O only that will give you a much higher throughput. But this is like the version one of the network. So if we want to make it really uh, scalable, we, or we want to make it and we have plans on that, we will create a sharded system where you like replicate one blockchain or uh, multiple times and then you can multiply the throughput or transactions per second. And did you check the, the plasma cache of Ethereum? Because maybe you can implement something like that too. 
And Plasma Cache is like a bit, it's not really sharding, but it's also not it's really off-chain, it's some hybrid solution. I mean, we are really looking, at least for the time being, into sharding, which means that you just split up your blockchain into multiple chains. I mean, off-chain solutions are, can be a good addition to it, but maybe they are, will be built by the application developers and not by ourselves. Yes, or I do have a... How do you prevent uh, these voting tokens to be sold, to be traded? The neurons. So the yeah. neurons, they are not, I mean, you cannot trade them because they are just locked, locked deposit. So you They're cannot, virtual. The so virtual. You, can, you cannot, but you could, of course, sell um, the fact that you're going to delegate your votes to mm -hmm. someone else. Exactly. You can bribe people to vote somewhere. So that's a very good, a tough question. So I think personally we should like have some cryptographic, fancy cryptography too, because there are schemes which prevent coercion and, and uh, buying votes where you can like vote anonymously. So you, you cannot even prove to an attacker or to a briber whether you voted or not on or which way you voted. So there are schemes to, um, which offer like some resistance. And I think if we really want to have a secure system, we will at some point need some additional mechanism. But but, but what we have with the de delegation is that it, it does, I mean, people want to keep their standing or their good reputation as a big neuron because they, other people follow them. So there is more than just money. It's also like reputation, which, is, which you can lose if you sell your votes. Thanks. Yeah? What is then ideal app for this platform? Like, what do you use in development today as a user case? So, like, so we, we have imagine a, this will be our user. Uh, okay, so maybe we have, um, like, another project that is in a conceptual phase, which is called Phi, which could make really use of this randomness. And Phi is now a, a sort of a decentralized banking system where you can, a bit like crowd lending, but it goes much further like, than crowd lending. And it also creates or is relies on a stable cryptocurrency because you want to lend or if you borrow some amount of money you want to be sure that your the same amount of money will be the, at the same um, uh, value when you have to pay it back so this is one of our like uh, potential use case applications that maybe we want to build ourselves or 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 fund it and and just to add to that i think that the uh, Big use cases, um, of course, transactions, like money transactions, will be like a first use case. Um, then I think that the fact that we're going to have this governance system built in will lend itself really well to just test how governance systems can work, so voting systems. And then I personally believe in um, applications that uh, just profit from transparency, education, identity, and all the stuff like that. And then, of course, everything that has to do with economy and, and financials um, inherently. So insurance, banking, loans, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transactions. I think all of those will be uh, stuff that will hopefully hit mainstream at some point uh, within the next few years. What did you select to develop? Yeah, we're, we're actually just starting well, that. Still it's still moving target right now. Um, so right now we're still at the level of like exchanging messages, exchanging transactions, building very simple stuff. Um, so we don't have, we have not zeroed in on like a higher level application yet. That's going to be something super exciting that I'm looking forward to within the next three to four months probably. Yeah. What's your size? <laughs> oh. um, yeah. Sorry. Um, you know. Sorry. Sorry. On. Uh, Bitcoin transactions are pseudo-anonymous. On Ethereum, it's uh, completely non-anonymous currently. Uh, there are plans to like, build some more technology on top of Ethereum to make anonymous transactions like ZK Snarks. Uh, how do you position Definity in terms of uh, privacy using this uh, threshold signature scheme? And uh, also, I'm interested what it uh, provides in terms of storage uh, using these threshold signature schemes. So for privacy, I'm not sure if like 
federal signatures are the, the way to offer it. But we, Zurich mentioned it already that we are um, planning to um, allow people to run their code in uh, what's called an enclave, which is uh, like an Intel SGX chip, for example, which can run your code in a trusted environment. It can create a signature on the output, and with that signature, you will know everyone can check that this code was like run by a secure platform. So, and with this kind of enclaves or SGX chips, we can r easily offer like private transactions or private. You can even like encrypt the whole state of your actor or smart contract and only let people with their keys to access it. And everyone, everything would be run in the an enclave. And only the enclave would know the, 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 the plain text, but the user wouldn't know it. Perfect. So um, if there's no other questions, then uh, we do have, oh, we got one more question. Perfect. And then we might break after that. Uh, sorry, I don't want to annoy you about uh, GDPR, but I believe uh, you are still <laughs> you know, in your storage, there's some personal data. Uh, uh -huh. What did you do to be compatible with the, the GDPR regulation so, I mean, from tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point because we have to be like, compliant with these regulations. But we are an, an, an infrastructure blockchain, which means that, I mean, we are, we are dealing with data on this layer or level, and the applications will then um, use personal data. So we, it's not, I'm, I'm not sure if we will like, really offer ways already to, on a system level, to like, um, automatically remove all data because there's this right of, uh, of, to get forgotten, for example. But we sure we will need to offer like the tools to our developers that they can use to comply with this regulation. We're, we're not no, live. We are not so live, so yeah. So there's no there's no reason to be uh, compliant tomorrow. <laughs> well, Robin and I are going to stick around. Where uh, thank you all for your questions and interest. And um, before we break, I'd like to really thank uh, Julian. Uh, yes, Julian made this all much. possible. It's thank been. You very uh, much, yeah been part of our community for a long time. Today is actually the first time that we meet face to face, but we've been uh, in touch over the past few weeks. And then of course, Connor and the Fusion team, thank you guys so much for having us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, but we're here, so uh, as long as you want to. Yes. Do you think that is a private invite to use it, or you so have some... Uh, share a link that you can uh, agree. Yeah. Okay. So there's different stages. Right now, this is like brand new. Like last Friday is the first time that we've uh, kind of packaged an SDK. So right now we're sharing it on, a, on an NDA basis to get feedback. So if you have a project that you're interested in uh, trying this out, just approach me and we'll figure it out. And then hopefully in a few months, depending on what the feedback look li looks like, we'll open it up to a larger community and uh, we'll be releasing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've been talking to someone in, in, in Berlin, um, Mr. Henning Dietrich. Yeah. Maybe you know. <laughs> of course. Um, and we were talking about artificial intelligence. Uh -huh. And um, we came to a picture of uh, these neurons. And there was the imagination rising of um, if this is scaling <coughs> with more and more neurons. How can we ensure that uh, the decisions and, I mean, the, the contracts that are made and all the, the information that is shared uh, is meant to be legal? So um, will there be a certain way of learning laws or can this blockchain make decisions on the information that is spread? And how and, and, and what will develop if these empathy or this way of um, realizing information within the blockchain becomes to a certain or develops to a certain point of automatic learning of the blockchain itself. You know what I mean? So it becomes more and more yeah. um, autonomous or yeah, while developing this empathy um, compared to what we are doing in between. 
So th there must be some dynamic or, you know, I always feel a, a touch of appearing artificial intelligence within this neuronal, uh, neural network. I don't know if I can explain it good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what I'll do is, uh, like, I'll give a short answer and then we can break. Short answer is we haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> and, uh, but let's break out and, and have that discussion because I think we have all, we have all different concepts, um, but we have not made a decision yet. But before that, uh, thank you all for coming and for all your questions and interest. And, uh, and we are hiring. Yes. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> What t-shirts I see?